All right, welcome everyone to the Ice Giant System seminar series. Uh, today we have Dr. Julie Castillo Roguez with us. Um, she'll give a bit of a about a 30 minute presentation and then we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, I wanted to point you to our website where we have um, all of the details about upcoming seminars. Um, I'll drop that in the chat shortly. Um, there we go. And we'll get to it. Um, Dr. Julie Castillo Roguez is a senior research scientist at the Jet Propulsion Lab. She received her PhD from Nantes University in France and came to JPL as a NASA research fellow in 2002. Her research specializes in the physical and chemical evolution of icy moons and dwarf planets. Uh, Dr. Castillo Roguez has been involved in several missions, including Cassini, Dawn as an extended mission project scientist, and she is part of the Europa Clipper gravity and radio science team. She's also a technology nerd and has been involved in several projects to enable small sets and onboard autonomy for deep space missions. And uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Mallory. And thanks to you and Jody for inviting me and organizing this seminar. I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, the major moons of Uranus. And um, and here you can see how you know this lovely picture from uh, JWST uh, showing the, the the moons that I'm going to focus uh, on, and I'm sure you're very familiar uh, with them in in this forum. So it's Miranda, Ariel, Umbriol, Titania, and Oberon, and I really really want to um, cheer for the moons today because you know when we talk about the exploration of ice giant systems we, people I mean most people really want to know about the planet and uh, but today I want to show a lot of love for the moons so let's see okay I want to thank thank my collaborators and contributors to this talk some of the slides that I'm going to present come from uh, uh friends from colleagues uh, and so um but yeah this work is really uh, multidisciplinary and and the idea is to cover multiple aspects uh of the moon's uh, internal evolution and current state and so i will start by presenting the science motivations for investigating uh, the evolution of the major moons of uranus um, and then I will focus on the, the meat of the talk is about the uh, type of modeling that we have been developing and that lead to predictions for future observations with uh, the Uranus orbiter and probe mission. And I will finish with uh, a few um, next steps uh, or aspects that need to be developed in the future. So, okay, so the best knowledge we have of the moon states back to uh, the flyby by, Euro, um, by Voyager 2 in 1986. And as you can see, these are all the pictures that have been uh, acquired uh, of the moons. And, um, and really the amount of observations that we have differ significantly from one moon to the other. And as you can see, Miranda has been well observed, uh, but Umbriel not so much. And uh, something important to keep in mind is that when Voyager 2 uh, flew by uh, the Uranian system, uh, the northern hemispheres of the moons were in the dark, in the night. And so altogether, we have about between 35 to 40 percent coverage of the surfaces of the moons. And so the good thing is that when uh, the next uh, mission to the Uranian system will uh, reveal what's going on, on on the other hemispheres. And so we are going to have a lot of surprises, hopefully. So the Uranian system is a uh, complex. It has many, many elements to it, like the other uh, large uh, giant planet systems. Uh, so this one is the only native ice giant satellite system uh, in our solar system. It has about, uh, it has 20, T7 non uh, moons with diverse geology. And, um, and as you can see here uh, at the bottom, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, there are multiple types of moons. There are the moons that are embedded with the rings. 
um, and that helps maintain the stability of the ring system. There are five major moons that are relatively close to the planet, and then there are a bunch of irregular moons um, farther away, and we think that these have been captured probably from the Kuiper belt. A very important thing to keep in mind is that the uh, system of Uranus is, has been tilted uh, by probably a very large impact or by dynamical interactions with the other giant planets. And as a result, the uh, rotation axis of the planet is almost uh, is close to the ecliptic. And so that creates, uh, I mean, it's for people like me who are um, challenged to buy uh, geometry, uh, the, the whole idea of you know, the seasons and night day uh, in, in this system is very different from what we are used to. Uh, and um, but that leads to a very exciting new way to, um, to, to think about these objects. Um, so uh, the Decadal uh, survey that was released last year prioritized um, uh, Uranus Orbiter and probe mission as the highest, uh, highest priority new flagship this decade. Uh, and it's really because this kind of mission that goes you know, a tour in a giant system uh, is poised to produce transformative, uh, groundbreaking science uh, by exploring all the objects in the system and looking really at a cross-disciplinary mm -hmm. approach, system-oriented, system-level uh, interactions between the various uh, objects um, uh, within the system. And so we had a similar uh, mission like this uh, that ended in 2017, that is Cassini. Cassini revealed a lot of uh, very fascinating um, uh, activities, you know, processes in the Saturnian system. And the uh, Cassini mission was all, Cassini Huygens uh, was also multi-generation uh, multi mission. It was uh, international, and, and that's what this kind of mission does, is that it really brings scientists together and, uh, and it's going to generate a lot of uh, collaborations, partnerships, and, uh, and we're very excited. Oh, personally, I'm very excited about this mission. So uh, within the system, there are the major moons uh, that are kind of science mysteries. Uh, we would like to understand when they formed, um, are they active today? There are signs of uh, activity uh, found at the surface, at least of Ariel and Miranda, uh, potentially Tenia. Um, and, uh, and then the big question is, are any of these moons ocean worlds? And by ocean worlds, I'm referring to objects that uh, could have uh, liquid, a deep ocean, so liquid at present. So um, there has not been a lot of work on the, the evolution of the moons since uh, this very nice paper by Husman et al. 2006 that looked at uh, evolution of icy moons across the board. And, uh, and between 2006 and now, you know, we've had the Cassini mission and we had other missions like uh, the Dawn mission at Ceres and the New Horizons mission. Uh, at Pluto and Chiron, and we've learned a lot about um, how this kind of object uh, evolves. And so the goal of this study that was published earlier this year is to um, infuse that knowledge uh, obtained from previous missions in order to um, develop new models of internal evolution that couple, oops, sorry, physical and chemical. Uh, evolutions as a function of uh, various assumptions on the moon origins. So I'm going to de detail this aspect now, the modeling. Um, so just to give you some idea of, of um, situational awareness, if you want, uh, in terms of the moon's um, geophysical properties, here I have plotted um, the five moons in terms of their densities and uh, radius. And uh, I have also added other objects formed in the solar system, and in particular the Saturnian moons. So you can see here Miranda is the smallest of the major moons. It's only about 240 kilometers in radius. 
Uh, it's about the same size as my mass and has about the same density, keeping in mind that uh, we don't know the densities of the moon very well. There is a large uncertainty. Uh, sorry, I don't know <laughs> why this is happening. There, there is a large uncertainty on um, the gravity data uh, and shape obtained by um, Voyager 2. Um, so the density of my mass is about 1200 kilogram, per, uh, sorry, of my mass and Miranda is about 1200 kilogram per cubic meter. Um, so Miranda is a bit anomalous is that its density is relatively low. The other moons have a radii between um, 500 and 800 kilometers, and their densities are uh, around 1600 kilograms per cubic meter, just an average value to give you uh, a general idea. And these moons are closer in properties to objects like Chiron, um, Ceres, and, and, and some of the mixed-sized moons uh, of the, in the Saturnian system. And so we can exploit these geophysical similarities and compositional similarities with other objects to develop new models. Um, so the big question that uh, we want to address uh, in the Uranian moon system is, can these objects that are relatively small and don't have a lot of tidal heating, can they be ocean worlds? Can they have uh, a deep ocean at present? So what I've done here is represented um, the major moons and uh, many other objects in the outer solar system as a function of their tidal heating and radiogenic heating. And these are about orders of magnitude because there are some uncertainties in these estimates. But still, we, we can identify several groups of objects. There are the non-ocean worlds, and these are large. They have a lot of radioisotope heating as well as tidal heating. Um, and we know most of them, we know that they have deep oceans confirmed uh, by geophysical measurements. Uh, Triton is an example. I have added, added Triton here, but we are not sure uh, if it have, has a deep ocean for... Uh, uh, I mean, we don't have a sorry, robust determination uh, of a deep ocean, but you know, its surface is really young, and uh, there is a strong reason to think that it has a deep ocean. Then there, are, there is a group of moons that are relatively small. They have low densities, so they have a small amount of rock and radioisotopes, and they don't have a lot of tidal heating. And so we think that in these moons, it's very unlikely that oceans could be present. Um, today. And then in the middle, there are a bunch of objects um, that are mid-sized, you know, in the, in, in the uh, 500 to 1,000 kilometers uh, in size, and they have, uh, they can have a large fraction of rock. My mass is an exception. They can have some tidal heating, so my mass has a lot of tidal heating. Um, but the other moons, they don't. And so it's unclear if these objects uh, have deep oceans at present. And uh, the roadmap to ocean worlds that was, that was uh, published a few years ago said that oh, maybe these objects are candidate or possible ocean worlds. And, um, and really, the situation depends on their circumstances, uh, their, their uh, unique circumstances. So what the Uranus Orbiter and Probe mission can do is, is test hypothesis, hypothesis about processes driving the formation and preservation of deep oceans uh, in, in the major moons. We can quantify the relative contributions of intrinsic properties, like the composition of the moons, versus external processes like uh, tidal resonances in creating and maintaining deep oceans in these objects. And what we have done in this work is create a baseline. Uh, and in this baseline, there is no tidal heating, for example. Um, and uh, if when a future mission observes the moons and reveals differences, departures from the baseline, uh, we can then uh, identify if there are uh, special circumstances affecting uh, the evolution and current states of these ob objects. And, uh, and in particular, um, we expect it's, it's very possible that there could be uh, tidal heating processes 
uh, affecting at least Ariol and Miranda that we don't suspect at present in the same way than uh, when Cassini discovered the very strong activity at Enceladus, you know, it revealed processes about dynamical um, processes in the Saturnian system uh, that we uh, we did not suspect. And so, and these investigations, you know, when we put everything we've learned um, about the moons all together, all the moons and all the dwarf planets, and, and so on, we can have a, a bigger picture understanding of the evolutions of these objects. So what we model here is major stages, um, so bulk evolution, uh, if you want. And we are not looking at details of the evolution, uh, but really what's happening in the bulk of the object. And uh, so there is a formation. Um, we assume that the moons are created uh, rock, a variety of ices, like uh, carbon-bearing ices and ammonia, and organic matter. Uh, it's one of the very, and it's really emerging, it's a work in progress. Uh, we are accounting for uh, the influence of organic matter in the geophysical evolution of these objects. Um, and so after a few million years or tens of million years after formation, we expect that the moon's differentiated to some extent. Uh, by as a result of global melting of the uh, ices and that uh, silicate or ro rock rich uh, and organic rich uh, mantle differentiated by density. Um, and uh, the properties of the accreted ices can uh, drive um, the redox properties of the ocean and its pH and uh, and. I will not talk about habitability today, but that's also something we're tracking here, how the original composition drives uh, the uh, deep ocean environment. Um, and then after a few hundred million years and about one billion years for some of the moons, uh, as a consequence of warming, um, the uh, rocky mantle is going to go through a phase of thermal metamorphism. Uh, and that is going to uh, lead to the release of water as a consequence of dehydration of the silicates, and then also the release of carbon dioxide in particular as a consequence of the breakdown of organics. Uh, but at that point, the, the shell is mostly frozen, and as a consequence, this uh, thermal metamorphism phase leads to the creation of a late ocean, uh, what we call the second generation ocean, that is whose composition is primarily uh, determined by um, the products of dehydration and, and breakdown of organics in the mantle. And, uh, and in these objects, uh, because there is not a lot of heat, we predict that uh, there would be a residual ocean. So, or, or there might not be a, any ocean at all. And, um, and so that's what I tried to represent here. Um, so here are some more details about the modeling. Uh, we uh, have started an effort um, funded by the Habitable Worlds program to couple a num number of uh, pieces of software. Uh, the core is the thermal evolution software. Um, and uh, we track, uh, as a function of temperature, the evolution of the rock, uh, the evolution of the crust as a consequence of um, freezing. And, and then we can track the composition of the residual ocean. Uh, we can also compute the electrical conductivity uh, of uh, the deep ocean. Uh, the code tracks porosity, which is very important here because we expect a lot of residual porosity in the crust. And then uh, something that is not coupled yet is uh, the early uh, geochemical evolution of the ocean as a consequence of water rock alteration. But we are working on, on doing this, and, and the work is carried out by Samuel Courville at the Arizona State University, who is also um, an intern at JPL, is going to couple of these pieces very nicely. Uh, and so that we can run many, many of these models in, in a more systematic manner. And just to 
um, emphasize here that we are not tracking tidal heating, which is okay for this particular, particular application because there is about 15 times less heat generated in the Uranian moons compared to the Saturnian moons if all the properties were uh, equal. And that is because the mass of Uranus is much less uh, than the mass of Saturn, and that is a big driver of, uh, of tidal heating. So um, we also account for a possible uh, various assumptions on the origin of the system. So the first type of uh, origin is formation from a circumplanetary disk. Um, and in that case, uh, the moon would have a composition, starting composition that is uh, solar-like, and, and we understand how to compute. Uh, this kind of composition and density, and they would be relatively ancient. They would have formed like uh, just uh, in the first few million years after the beginning of the solar system. Uh, a different, uh, very different kind of origin model is that the moon formed as a, as a, as a consequence of a disk of debris generated by a giant impact of an object, an unidentified object, with Uranus that could be responsible for the tilting of uh, the planet. And in that case, the starting composition in the disk would be either carbonaceous, carbonaceous chondrite or a cometary in nature. We think that this event is relatively ancient, but still it would happen after the decay, the decay of uh, aluminum-26. And um, aluminum-26 is a short-lived radioisotope. It's a very, very powerful uh, source of heat uh, and can determine the long-term evolution, the, the, the differentiation and, the, uh, and then setting the long-term evolution of the objects, provided that uh, the moons uh, formed within you know, 10 million years. Uh, after what we call the calcium aluminium inclusion that determines uh, the um, that we use for the early concentration of aluminium 26. And um, and so, sorry, the, bo the, the, the bottom line is just that if the moon formed after 10 million years, after the, about the beginning of the solar system, they have no aluminium 26. So they start very, very cold. And then uh, a model that is relatively recent is that the moons. Uh, formed from a disk, an ancient uh, and massive ring uh, around Uranus. Um, and that is a model that was introduced by uh, Sébastien Charnoz uh, around 2011 when he was working on, on um, uh, the, the origin of the uh, Saturnian moons. And Robin Canop also suggested this model for the origin of the moons formed from um, a ring. Uh, that might ha have different possible origins. And one could be that it's a, a large object that got disrupted, uh, like a large center disrupted by uh, passing uh, close to the planet, or it could have been a first generation of moon that migrated inward uh, and got disrupted. So we don't understand uh, exactly how that would work in the Uranian system in terms of the, the timing of formation of the moons. Uh, some people like uh, Alistair Rodan, Mark Neveze are looking into this, and so I expect that there would be more pro progress on uh, this topic in the next few years. Um, but we, we know that the current uh, rings of uh, Uranus are rich in organics, um, and, uh, and so that at, that's at least one piece of information that we can use in the models. And then uh, something that is guaranteed is that if the moons emerged from the rings, they have a significant uh, porosity. So as I mentioned earlier, we are also accounting for um, carbon in the form of organic matter and carbon bearing ices uh, in this modeling. And this is because uh, recent dynamical and accretion models have suggested that about all IC objects in the outer solar system, accreted uh, pebbles, cometary pebbles, 
uh, and the idea that these pebbles come from far away in the solar system, but then cross the disk, then form encounter uh, growing planetesimals, uh, and in the disk they are going to uh, uh, accrete very very fast on, on these uh, seeds of planetesimals. Um, and so this could explain the rapid formation of the moons and other objects. Um, and the consequence of this is that we believe, based on the Rosetta missions as well as other ob observations of comets, that uh, these pebbles they had a lot of uh, organic matter. And Rosetta found uh, up to 45 weight percent of insoluble organic matter in the dust of 67P. Uh, and so that is a, a very large amount of organics. And so we, we have to make sure the models account for, for this. Um, and there are other aspects that are important to keep in mind. And it's especially the fact that because you have ammonia and um, carbon dioxide, carbon uh, monoxide in the system, uh, this uh, interplay, uh, I mean, these species can modulate, uh, can determine the redox properties of deep ocean. That has a consequence for habitability. Uh, and so, as I said, uh, because there is so much uh, carbon in the system, you can see carbon here is about the, as abundant as hydrogen and oxygen uh, in a molar fraction and in wet fraction, at least in the solid uh, phase of um, in the in the refractory phase of uh, com cometary material, the organics are almost as abundant as the rock. And as a consequence, the organics dilute uh, the amount of radioisotope uh, accreted in uh, these objects formed from pebble accretion. And that is really, really problematic from a heating standpoint, of course. And then we'll show uh, some consequences in, in the next few slides. Another aspect is that the thermal conductivity of organic matter is uh, twice to 10 times slower than uh, the thermal conductivity of ice and rock. And so that's also going to affect internal evolution. And there are other aspects that are make organics very exotic materials to work with. So one of the big knowledge gaps that uh, we've been investigating is the fate of organics following accretion. There have been two types of models uh, presented in the literature um, in a model of Titan by uh, Neri et al. Uh, it's assumed that the organics would entirely sink with uh, the rock and never move away from uh, the rocky mantle. So that's one model. Then there is a model uh, published for Pluto by McKinnon et al. Where they assume that no organics uh, sync with the rocks and the organics separate right away during the differentiation phase and form a thick layer uh, uh, settled at the interface between the hydrosphere and the uh, rocky mantle. And the consequence of this is that, as you can see, there is so much organics that the hydrosphere is effectively uh, very thin. And, and the consequence is that there is, it's very difficult to uh, preserve deep oceans in these conditions. And so in this model, we, uh, we are assuming this, sorry, in this uh, talk, I'm assuming this kind of model. We are working on the second type of model, but it's more complicated. And so I'm going to stick with model one, but we have to keep in mind that uh, at least in the accreted material, if we look at uh, carbon acids, chondrites, the, uh, the organics and uh, the silicates, they are very intimately uh, mixed. And so uh, it's, uh, it, it's likely that a large fraction of the organics are going to um, differentiate with the rock because it's difficult to, to disorb the organics from the silicates, uh, at least based on, on, on our analysis so far. And so as mentioned earlier, we track metamorphism in these objects um, because it's likely to happen in many, many objects that are relatively large. Uh, and uh, the big deal here is that the organic matter, they represent a very significant source of carbon dioxide um, and, uh, when, they break, when it breaks down. 
And so it's fate in the mantle. It's going to determine how much carbon dioxide is released to the deep ocean. And that have a, can have a very strong implication about the state of the ocean at present. Of course, that can be oil, oil, oils as well. And, and that's what we're trying to track. Um, and, and the consequence of thermal metamorphism differ from one object to another, depending on, on the size, size of the object. So just to give you an example uh, here obtained by uh, my colleague Mohit Melwani Daswani, um, and that's a paper we published last year for Ceres. Uh, Mohit tracked the uh, abundance, uh, I mean, the concentrations of various uh, compounds in the ocean as a function of temperature. And here you can see that uh, when the temperature increases, there is release of um, sulfide, um, hydrogen sulfide that uh, comes from the breakdown of uh, iron sulfide in the mantle. And then when the temperature keeps uh, increasing, we have the release of a significant amount of carbon dioxide coming from uh, carbonate breakdown and organic breakdown. Uh, and so having so much carbon uh, dioxide in the ocean is likely responsible for the formation of a late generation of carbonates and could explain why we have these vast expanses of carbonates on uh, the surface of Ceres. I'm just going to take 10 seconds to put the light back in my office. Sorry about that. Sorry. So uh, we, uh, uh, Mohit, uh, can also track um, the um, uh, properties, the, the density uh, of the rock in the mantle as a function of temperature and pressure. And this is just a night nice chart to show uh, what we have in terms of CI composition and cometary composition. We use that data uh, then to uh, get a, a more accurate, you know, as far as can be, of uh, the um, rocky mantle density and hydrosphere, the thickness of the hydrosphere for the various moons. And so in the case of embryol and aerial, we um, find rocky mantle densities around 3,000 kilograms per cubic make, uh, meter. Uh, the density of the mantle is higher in the case of Oberon and Titania because of uh, more advanced thermal metamorphism and dehydration. In the case of Miranda, uh, the problem is very unconstrained. And so here is our baseline model. Um, we find that uh, in the four largest moons, uh, oceans up to 50 kilometers uh, and with temperature above the uh, water uh, melting point uh, should be present um, today under an icy shell that is about 200 kilometers thick. Um, there is, as I noted, there is, uh, we can see very well here, but there should be a very thick layer, about 80 kilometers in the case of Titania, of uh, residual porous uh, material, so really pristine material. Uh, and then uh, in the case of Titania, uh, thermal metamorphism is advanced and, and can release, can be responsible for most of the uh, deep ocean volumes that we see at present. It's not, the thermal metamorphism is not as advanced in the case of aerial. And in the case of Miranda, uh, we could not find models that preserve uh, deep oceans at today. And that is because there is no tidal heating involved. Of course, maybe tidal heating could play uh, a big role in Miranda since it's uh, the closest large moons uh, to, to the planet. If we, and so, sorry, so that's our baseline assuming a CI composition. If we assume a comet composition, then because there is much less heat coming from radioisotope, uh, there is no phase of uh, thermal metamorphism uh, leading to dehydration of the rock in uh, any of the moons. And we predict deep oceans at present that are just a few kilometers thick. Um, and again, there is a very thick uh, crust of porous and pristine rock at the surface. And as I said, tidal heating uh, could have an impact at least on Miranda aerial and Umbriol. Um, 
And uh, there, are, there is some evidence based on geological properties that maybe Ariel went through a phase of uh, increased heating associated with a tid uh, tidal resonance crossing about 1 billion years ago. Uh, is, that surface might be even younger. The problem with um, Miranda is that it is so small and it has so little rock that um, it, freeze, it refreezes very fast. And so if Miranda had liquid at present, it would imply that it went through a tidal resonance crossing uh, less than a few tens of million years ago, and it might still be involved in such resonance. And it's so some groups have, have been modeling this relatively well. In the case of aerial, we can see that the, it might be possible to reproduce uh, tidal resonance crossing about one billion years ago. It's less clear in the case of Miranda and Ambriol uh, when the resonance happened. So I'm going to talk about the predictions, and I think I'm only running a bit late on time, so I'm going to pass on this one just to show you that we can make a lot of predictions uh, from these models that inform you know, gravity shape, induced magnetic field, and uh, optical remote sensing. So one uh, finding from this work is that it will be difficult to determine the moon's uh, density structure uh, from gravity. Uh, and um, here you can see the, I represented the moment of inertia, which is a way to um, describe the density profile in the moons. Uh, so I presented it as a function of the rocky mantle density and assuming a reasonable uh, um, uncertainty of 0 0.01. Uh, and because there is a lot of uncertainty or at least a wide parametric space uh, possible for uh, describing the shell, uh, the shell density range is large. And as a consequence, uh, you can see that it would be difficult to pin down uh, to pin down an exact density, uh, rocky mantle density for the moons. Unless they are very cometary uh, in um, composition or, or at the other end of the spectrum, they are a pure CI contrary composition, and then it might be uh, easier to, um, to narrow down uh, to narrow down the internal structure. And same for the shell thickness. At least if we use only gravity data, we expect uh, 70 to 80 kilometers uncertainty on the determination of the shell thickness, uh, of the hydrosphere thickness, sorry. And, uh, and one exception is Miranda. So we expect that the oceans uh, will be rich in uh, a lot of impurities like ammonia, ammonium, carbonates, and chlorides. And here I have represented the fraction of liquid left in the moons as a function of temperature. And here I have represented the corresponding ocean thickness, uh, taking aerial as, a, as an example. So here are the two ex, uh, reference cases that I, I mentioned earlier. A CI composition leads to um, an ocean that's about up to 50 kilometers thick. Uh, and here, a comet, uh, cometary, ocean, uh, cometary origin leads to oceans that are dominated by ammonia and are just a few kilometers thick. And, uh, and this plot here, it's more of a night chart, but it just shows you that how we compute the, um, uh, the composition. Uh, we have the abundance of um, material in the ocean as a function of thickness, and we get that from the Freskem uh, code. And so for oceans that are relatively thin, you know, ammonia and chloride dominate, and the consequence is that this kind of environment is not habitable. Um, so the last point here is that when oceans are cold uh, because of the inverse dependence of electrical conductivity on temperature, there is a concern that these oceans that are thin and cold, they don't have a signature in the, uh, an induced magnetic field signature. And so, and as you, uh, you know, uh, magnetic induction, um, is a primary source of information on deep oceans. And um, 
I'm going to pass on this one because I'm running late. But the idea is that if you have a briny ocean, uh, it should uh, have an induced field signature uh, as a consequence of going around a planet that has uh, a changing magnetic field uh, and um, as presented here for Europa. Um, but here, uh, and that's a, a chart that comes from my colleague Corey Cochrane, uh, it shows the ocean conductivity as a function of ocean thickness. And um, and so, uh, uh, sorry, it, it shows the magnetic field, the induced magnetic field amplitude as a function of ocean conductivity and ocean thickness. And so you can see that if we have deep oceans that are only like 10 to 20 kilometers and are, uh, have a low, uh, electrical conductivity because of you know it's dominated by ammonia and the temperature is cold, then it's very possible that the oceans are not detectable. And uh, Ben uh, Weiss and uh, colleagues looked into this, and uh, they suggested that oceans might be detected uh, with a Uranus orbiter and probe um, in at least uh, the four moons that are close to uh, to the planet, but ocean characterization. Uh, might not be possible in most of the moons, only in Miranda and Ariel. And then on top of this, there is a possibility that the moon acquired uh, a remanent magnetization of um, metal-rich uh, compounds in the rocky mantle uh, while they were differentiating and, um, and uh, they acquired uh, an imprint of the magnetic field of Uranus. And that magnetic field could have an amplitude well above one nanotest and overwhelm um, the signature coming from the deep ocean. So that's work in progress by uh, Sam Courville, and there will be more presented in the future by Sam. So because we are, we are concerned that a deep ocean might not be detected via um, magnetometry, We've looked with Andres Romero Wolf and colleagues about the possibility to use uh, the Uranian kilometric radiation, um, like it's a radio wave uh, with lo at low frequency. And when it passes through uh, the moons, it acts like a, it's like a radar experiment uh, because the cold ice is transparent to radio waves. And um, and uh, that wave might uh, should be able to detect the interface between the icy shell and the deep ocean, and so that is work in progress. But it's very promising as a technique that would complement magneto ma magnetic field measurements. And just a quick word on work uh, carried out by uh, my colleague Jennifer Scully, who had this eureka moment that, wow, there are features on uh, the Uranian moons, geological features that look like features found at Ceres by the Dawn mission, uh, like um, bright, this bright region here in the Wanda uh, Basin, and uh, that might be an expression of evaporites at the surface uh, of, the, uh, of Embryol. Or oh, there is this big mountain on Oberon, 11 kilometers tall, that comes out of nowhere. And there is this big mountain on Ceres, Haunamons, that also comes out of nowhere. And so maybe there are similar processes going on there. And that could be possible because the moons and Ceres share uh, physical properties, similar geophysical properties. And so just to summarize, here I, I, I have. Um, tracked various properties that could be measured by uh, Uranus orbiter and probe for uh, different origins. Um, so definitely the thickness of the ocean uh, could be very strongly dependent on the uh, composition of the starting material, but there are caveats, uh, and uh, that is true for you know, any uh, internal evolution model, and especially Alisa Rodan mentioned to me uh, recently, that large impacts can uh, influence very significantly the cooling of the moon, so they can also uh, influence the heating. And so and that's work in, in progress by Alisa. Um, the composition of the ocean might tell us about origin, but it's difficult to measure and assume that there is recent exposure of material. Uh, if uh, the moon secreted from uh, 
uh, cometary material, they should have a lot of um, organics on their surface and maybe much less um, if they are created from a chondritic material. Uh, and then we might be able to get information on the hydrogen to carbon ratio in the organics. That is a function of uh, the starting material. Um, and then ideally it would be taxed to be able to get uh, carbon uh, and hydrogen isotopes uh, as has been done in the Saturnian system uh, by Roger Clark and colleagues using infrared spectroscopy. Uh, just one thing, it's very possible uh, that surface material has many several sources, many sources. Um, there could be, so there is the material that uh, comes from uh, the interior of the object that is exposed or excavated by impact, but it's possible that there is dust coming from irregular satellites, um, that uh, there is uh, accreted ring material, at least in the case of Miranda, and then there is the effect of space quivering. And so entangling what's going on at the surface of the moon, it's going to be tricky. And, uh, and so just to summarize, um, the moons are likely residual oceans. Uh, we can make uh, predictions on the composition of materials that may be exposed on the surface. Uh, but because there are many uncertainties uh, about the internal structure and about the origin uh, of the surface of, of these objects, it, we recommend that multiple techniques uh, be used uh, for their exploration. And so on top of an infrared spectrometer, it would be great to have a dust analyzer especially to study the organics. And we strongly recommend adding a radio plasma wave spectrometer to magnetometer to search for deep oceans. And I will uh, provide more updates about the origins assessment at the AGU. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much. Put your claps in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for this. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, feel free to either raise your hand uh, or put it in the chat and I'll read it out loud. Uh, I'll go ahead and start. Um, you touched a little bit on astrobiological potential. Um, you said you weren't gonna talk too much about it, uh, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the astrobiological implications for uh, the chondrite versus the comet uh, source. Yeah, thanks for asking uh, this. Um, so, as you can see here, the, the comet model, they lead to cold oceans. And here I have put the limit temperature about 248K, below which we don't think life. Uh, would be possible. And so th there is a strong chance that strong chance that this kind of medium uh, would not be habitable. On the other hand, if a future mission finds a deep ocean, uh, a thick ocean in some of the moons, uh, it's more likely to be closer to the water ice melting point and less influenced by um, uh, anti-freeze uh, species. And then it's more likely to be uh, habitable. I'm not sure we can tell much more. And the problem is that with the Uranus orbiter and probe will be limited in the kind of information we get. Okay, we have a question from Matija. Go ahead. Hello, that's a great talk, Julie. Uh, I have a question about the origin of satellites from a ring uh, that's Crida and Chernot. Uh, I haven't heard that apply to Uranus yet. So uh, how would the system spread all the way to its present location? Like how would uh, Oberon and Titania get where they are? Yeah. Place? So Mattia, I, I apologize because I'm I'm just quoting the work. I am not too familiar about the, their modeling. Uh, I can send you the paper. Um, what what I, I think personally is that it might be very difficult to create the large moons, the largest moons in the system, just accreted from rings. But I'm wondering if Miranda, which is so special, I mean, its density is very low, it must have some porosity, if at least Miranda would come from the rings. 
Yeah, so we looked a little bit into Miranda. Uh, so for the, for the Saturnian system, the moon spread tidally eventually. And mm -hmm. as you said, tides are much weaker in the Uranian system just because of the mass of the planet. Now, Miranda is kind of border case. Um, um, David Minton looked into it uh, a few years back, but uh, to get out where you are by ring torques, you need to have one of the major resonances in the ring. So basically you can get to four Uranus radii, but not five. So it's kind of not quite working for Miranda, but it's close. Okay, thanks. So yeah, I'll be interested in iterating with you about that. Um, we have a question from Martin. Go ahead. Hmm. Hi, Julie. Very nice work. Um, I just wanted to um, query a bit about the composition of the comet model that you assumed. Uh, I didn't catch whether your comet composition is based purely on 67P, um, because as we know from observing comets, like each comet we observe is slightly different from the last. Yeah. So there may be some scope for some dramatically different uh, carbon, nitrogen, or organic abundances um, in sort of the overall comet population compared to the the one case of 67P that we have accurate information for. So I wondered if any sort of changes on the, uh, of abundances around a factor of three or so would have significant impacts on your results. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's that's a very good point. That is just one. Uh, and member, and uh, there could be uh, strong variability, and they, we could have mixtures of CI and cometary uh, material as well. And so, yeah, it's here what the bulk of this work using a high uh, content in organics has been applied to Pluto in particular. Uh, and this particular model might not be applicable to the Uranian moons. Um, and so, yeah, so it's a, it's a spectrum of possibilities. Thanks for pointing this out. Thanks. All right, we have a question from Ronica. Uh, you referred to Uranus as having the only native ice giant satellite system. Uh, why not Neptune too? Uranus has potential captures like Neptune. Uh, right, so what that I meant is just that um, with the capture of Triton in Neptune, it um, disrupted the system. Uh, it's been suggested that the capture of uh, Triton induced a lot of collisions in the system. And um, and so the, the moons, they are not uh, representative. They are not pristine anymore. Uh, but that might also be true of the Uranian system because the moons went through uh, a chaotic, oh, you know, a phase of uh, high collision during the early history as a consequence of the tilting of the planet, maybe. All right, we have a question from Thomas. Is there a chance to detect oceans with radar from an orbiter, or else would the magnet magnetometric detection be easier with a lander? Yeah, so we we try to look at you know, what's in the stroma and what's currently planned uh, in the Uranus orbiter and probe and not depart too much. And it's true that a lander, um, electromagnetic sending, for example, from a lander might be good. Uh, a radar might be good, um, but um, this ma these options might be out because of, uh, you know, mass power and cost constraints for uh, Uranus orbiter and probe. For the radar, one thing is that we expect only a few flybys of the moons in the tour. Uh, and so it's unclear that we would get a good enough radar data uh, in these conditions. But ideally, you know, if we had all the moon in the world and uh, if we could dedicate the entire resources of the Uranus orbiter and probe to just studying the moons, uh, yeah, we could do a lot of, of very cool things. All right, I don't see any more questions. Uh, feel free to keep putting those in the chat or raising your hand. Um, otherwise, let's thank Julie again. Um, and I'll turn it over to Jody to give an update on some community news. Thank you so much. Sure, yeah, and I'll just echo that. Thank you so much, Julie. It was a really incredible, incredible talk. It's making me more and more excited for uh, you know, a flagship to uh, to Uranus. So I'm stoked about it. 
Uh, and then, yeah, and there's tons of thank yous and, and, you know, comments and stuff like that in the chat. Feel free to check them out. I know uh, Bill McKinnon had a few, a few comments here and there. And so I've been kind of scrolling through and just noting them. Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and, and share the, the community news slides. So, um, it, you know, if this is your, if this is your first time here at the end of these, uh, we always share this uh, slide of kind of accumulated uh, hopefully folks can see that, uh, accumulated, I guess, information in the community relevant to this particular group of folks. Um, and uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll copy and paste everything into the chat because I know <laughs> you all can't click on my screen share. Of course not. So, uh, so let me paste this in here. Um, but, but as always, you know, if you have something that you'd like to uh, have included in this community news slide, feel free to reach out to me or Mallory and we'd be happy to include it. Just anything that you think might be relevant. So this could be stuff like um, positions that are opening. It could be things like upcoming, you know, workshops or conferences or things like that. And so um, I'll just point out that next month, the Ice Giant System Seminar Series um, has a talk from Dr. Ian Cohen. Cohen um, and so that'll be, as always, the second Tuesday at uh, 11 a.m. Uh, and I think Mallory posted the uh, oh, it, I copied and pasted. So yeah, so you have all these links. Um, and then in a couple of days, this um, graduate student peer mentorship program, the deadline is going to close for that. So make sure you get um, your applications in for that if you'd like to participate. Um, there's also two faculty positions that uh, I just noticed opened up. So the one, and, and they're kind of a broad planetary science uh, sort of, uh, you know, category. So nothing specific that I noticed, uh, you know, in terms of I, well, I, I guess the second one is geophysics and atmosphere is a little bit more specific. So there's one at Arizona State University deadline in mid-October and then um, at Caltech deadline at the beginning of, of October. Uh, and then particularly relevant for this community uh, of, you know, folks interested in, in I guess, giant satellites um, or, or satellites of giants. Uh, there's the, the workshop on Galilean satellites and radiation environment, and that's the beginning of October too. And then of course, OPAG in, uh, at the end of November in Colorado. So we're excited for that too. Uh, but as always, if you have anything you'd like to put on these slides, uh, just to kind of get the word out, you know, we'd be happy to kind of plug your event position meeting, you know, anything like that, um, that you kind of want to get the word out. The, the whole, the whole point of this, uh, seminar series is, of course, to 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 get have folks an opportunity to share their work and and for the audience to kind of learn, but it's also to keep the community together uh, as we as we sort of you know start making plans for uh, flagship to to Uranus and and of course just in general keeping the ice giants community together as a whole. Um, so excited that that you're all here and and feel free to spread the word uh, about it and go to the website and. Um, you know, sign up for the list so you can get these emails. Uh, but I think that's all I have, unless Mallory, if you have anything else. Um, but otherwise, you know, we can close things up. And again, thank you so much, Julie. Really incredible talk. Um, and yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave this, this slide up and uh, folks can feel free to uh, hop off. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Take care. Take care.